good morning students and uh, i have a small portion in uh, second chapter paper 8 that is immunological techniques and this portion will include immunochemical techniques like understanding what is the principle of precipitation like how precipitation occur and what are the application of pre precipitation uh, concept in immunology and then we'll understand the same principle and application of agglutination concept and how it is occurring few application of it then we'll take up immuno diffusion the techniques in immuno diffusion like uh, you have um, diffusion um, single diffusion double diffusion then immuno electrophoresis then uh, radio uh, assay elisa or the radiography so this lecture will include all this uh, before i start up anything i just want to say, uh, say few words about antibody and antigen now uh, antibodies you know they are produced against a specific antigen now for example if you have a pathogen a bacteria the whole pathogen is not an antigen there are specific moieties like uh, um, carbohydrates or it can be a lipid or it can be a protein which is recognized as non self by the immune system and that immune system trains the immune cells the b cells to produce antibody so like any enzyme and uh, substrate it is a lock and key concept that means a particular site if it is a protein the whole protein is called as an antigen and the a site or the specific sequence which will be recognized by the antibody will be called as the epitope so that and this antibody will have something called like a lock and key concept and also there will be other non covalent bonds which help in binding of this uh, antibody to antigen so there are certain terms by which uh, antibody antigen interactions are explained like in terms of affinity affinity means the intensity of the reaction between an antigenic determinant and one active site on the antibody molecule that mean that is the definition of affinity and something called as avidity avidity is like the total strength by which an antigen binds to m multiple antigenic determinants and multivalent antibodies and also something called as specificity specificity is defined as the ability of a particular antibody active a site to recognize and interact with only a single antigenic determinant or the ability of a population of antibody molecule to react with only single antigen okay there can be cross reactivity also for example if you take blood group blood group the terminal uh, sugars are the one which are determining the um, mm, determining the specificity of the blood group but there can be cross reactivity also so with this little def definitions about the um, various terminologies now the principle of uh, antigen antibody reaction has uh, uh, like you can you use those terminologies in explaining agglutination and uh, precipitation and further slides so the first one what will be starting with is what is agglutination the principle of agglutination and, and then we'll move about precipitation and other things the word agglutination come from the latin agglutinare meaning to glue uh, referring to clumping of substances agglutination is defined as the visible clumping of particulate antigen when mixed with antibodies specific for it in the presence of electrolytes at an appropriate temperature and ph now antibodies are capable of binding multiple antigen molecules linking them to create a large latex like complex which can be visible to naked eye so such antibodies uh, are called as agglutinins 
all antibodies are capable of doing this but only ig igm has the highest ability to agglutinate uh, 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 theoretically large antigens with multiple epitope easily adhere to partic particles such as animal cell or bacteria when combined with specific antibodies resulting in cross linking so the process of agglutination is having two steps the first step is sensitization and the second step is lattice formation so when you have a solution of an antigen when you have a solution of an antibody when you mix those two solution in a uh, small test tube there is agglutination forming and there are layers which are formed sensitization is what happens when both come together is the recognition and attachment of a specific antibody to corresponding antigen at a particular temperature ph and time of incubation influencing the reaction if it is in uh, solution phase then it is immediate if it, there is if it is in agarose then it takes its own time to form agglutination then you once the antigen antibody come together there is lattice formation by cross linking between sensitized particles so if you imagine uh, like for example here if you imagine this test tube is mixed with antibody solution and antigen solution and here you have a zone of equivalence i have taken sorry this should have been agglutination if you take particulate antigens like the big cells if you take our erythrocytes and this is igm antibody which is raised against a particular epitope then you have this agglutination line form so there are like three zones right one zone where there is more of antigen one zone there is equivalence and one zone there is more of antibody so agglutination is a serological reaction similar to precipitation with the exception of antigen being large and particulate in case of agglutination both reactions are inhibited by antibody excess and this phenomena is called the prozone effect this one where there is more of antibody prozone effect whereas in case of antigen it is called as post zone effect if the antigen is an integral part of the surface of the cell or other insoluble particle the agglutination is called as direct agglutination if uh, if a cell or insoluble particle can be coated with a soluble antigen such as viral antigen a polysaccharide or a heptin and the coated cells can be used in agglutination test and then it is called as passive agglutination if you are using directly the bacterial cells it is direct agglutination if you are taking the antigens out of the bacterial cells and then coating it on a particle and then trying to you know, see whether there are antibodies in the serum then that becomes the passive agglutination test okay so agglutination reactions used for diagnosis of dis diseases uh, in lab either uses the particulate or soluble antigen if it is particulate like for example in uh, typhoid test vidal test salmonella typhi bacteria is used to detect a, C a specific antibody in the serum of the patient suffering from typhoid fever so that is a uh, agglutination types of particles which participate in agglutination reactions are erythrocyte bacterial cell inert carrier such as latex particles now coming to ap uh, application of agglutination agglutination or hemagglutination what we call as uh, it, it's it can be qualitative quantitative passive i have already mentioned about passive or a, a example of an agglutination is a comb test i'll tell you each one what it is for example quantitative agglutination test it is like quantitative manner to assay for the presence of an antigen or an antibody for example when the antibody is combined 
with a particular antigen, the agglutination of this antigen indicates a positive test. We'll take an example. Individual erythrocytes can be mixed with antibody specific to different blood group antigen to determine his blood group. Right? Uh, alternatively, an individual serum is mixed with erythrocyte uh, of known blood type to assay for the presence of antibody uh, to the blood type in the person's serum. So that is an example of a qual qualitative agglutination test. In quantitative ag agglutination test, uh, here, um, uh, like quantitative where the level of antibodies to a particular antigen can be measured. In this kind of a test, when it is performed, you have to make serial dilutions of sample to be tested for antibody and then fixed number of erythrocytes or bacteria or other particulate antigen is added. The maximum dilution that gives visible aggl agglutination is then determined to know the titer. And by knowing the titer, you can uh, interpret the concentration of the agglutinating agent. Passive agglutination is like uh, is the same as passive heme agglutination. Heme agglutination. Okay, that's what I explained uh, uh, before. Comb test, like erythrocytes interact with antibodies. Agglutination may not always be uh, seen. Okay, this could be due to deviation from antigen antibody ratio that is the uh, uh, pre zone from its optimal concentration or the erythrocytes could be preventing cross-linking of cells. In order to detect the non-agglutinating antibodies on erythrocyte, a second antibody directed against the antibody attached to their respective epitope on erythrocyte is added. The anti-immunoglobulin can now cross-link the erythrocytes and result in agglutination. This test is known as Coom test or anti-immunoglobulin test. Coom test is based on two important facts that antibodies of one species are immunogenic when injected into another species leading to production of anti-immunoglobulins. Many anti-immunoglobulins bind with antigenic determinant present on the FC region. So you have the erythrocytes. Now you already have the antibodies which are bound but these are not agglutinating. So you put the secondary antibody. This is the FC region. Right? This one. FC region and then you see the agglutination okay so that was about what is agglutination and applications of agglutination now we'll come up to what is precipitation principle of precipitation and then we'll see examples it is a type of antigen antibody reaction in which the antigen occurs in soluble form there it was particulate when a soluble and, uh, antigen interacts with a specific antibody at an optimum pH and uh, temperature in the presence of electrolyte, antigen antibody complex is formed uh, from insol and forms an insoluble precipitate. This kind of reaction is called as precipitation reaction. Now in this also a lattice is formed between the antigens and antibody. In certain cases it is visible as insoluble precipitate. Antibodies that aggregate soluble antigens are called precipitins. So here the antigen should be bivalent or polyvalent in order to interact with the antibody and form um, precipitin, precipitin line. The antigen antibody lattice formation is governed by valency of both antibody and antigen. 
the antibody should be polyvalent in order to form uh, a precipitate the antigen should be bivalent or polyvalent that is uh, should at least two copies of the epitope or have different epitopes that uh, are capable of reacting with various antibodies in a polyclonal antisera so the same way you can see that the zone uh, if you have a mixture of antigen and antibody now once slow diffusion happens between these two layers now there is zone of equivalence where visible uh, precipitation can be seen and then there will be zone of antigen excess and there will be zone of antibody ex uh, excess so the same is depicted here okay so application of precipitation reaction so now um, uh, it can this precipitation can be carried out either quantitative or qualitative way uh, where you you can detect antigens easily the type of precipitation reactions are ring test uh, ring test uh, this is used for detection of bacterial antigen uh, like anthrax in tissue or dead animal uh, dead animals or man okay and the next is slide test in a clean slide uh, a drop of antigen is taken and a drop of antibody is mixed flocules appear for example vdrl uh, slides which is used for detection of syphilis uh, is example for precipitation slide test tube test where antigen antibody are allowed to react in tubes to form precipitate for example of such test is a khans test for syphilis uh, is done in this way in tube then precipitation uh, in gels where, where you have this immunodiffusion single diffusion and then double diffusion and then you have electro immunodiffusion so those things we will take up in detail that immunodiffusion and electro immunodiffusion and then see what it is so in brief now you want if you want to know the difference between what is agglutination and what is uh, precipitation there are three distinct points which give differences between uh, what is agglutination and precipitation the zones what are formed when there is antigen equivalence there is equivalent zone when there is antigen excess it is post zone when there is antibody excess it is it results in pro zone those are same but in case of agglutination there is particulate antigen or antibody in case of precipitation there is a soluble antigen or antibody the reaction time uh, is very less in case of agglutination minutes to hours in case of precipitation it takes hours to days uh, agglutination test results are qualitative or semi qualitative but precipitation results are qualitative semi qualitative or quantitative so th the three points first and then fourth and fifth points are very important you have to rem remember so coming to uh, each one we'll uh, we'll take up immunodiffusion so here i have shown you first we'll take up uh, single immunodiffusion okay this is also called as mancini method okay this is this is a type of precipitation reaction it's based on the principle how precipitation curve is formed those three zones how it is formed by interaction of antigen and antibody now how this procedure is formed is you have to take agarose you melt it and then cool down and add anti serum which contains antibody uh, is mixed into the agarose and pulled onto the slide and then holes are punched and uh, uh, carefully those circles are made a series of standard antigen containing known antigen are placed in separate wells 
as i have mentioned here one two um, it's not mentioned but still one two three four three uh, four separate antigen wells are there into that different concentration of antigens are added and allowed to diffuse keep it in a moist chamber and allowed to diffuse once they diffuse those zones are formed first there will be antigen excess then there will be equivalence and then there will be antibody ex ex uh, excess so now you know that a specific antigen uh, diffuse and they form precipitin lines with a different diameters the ring shape uh, bands of precipitins are formed concentrically around the wells indicating the reaction the the diameter of the precipitate ring formed corresponds to the amount of antigen in the solution okay so absence of a precipitant ring means there is no interaction at all if there is any interaction you get those precipitant ring the greater the amount of antigen in the well the farther the ring will travel right so you can make a graph of known concentration measure the diameter and you can make a graph of known concentration of what antigen and what antibody you have added and then uh, you can measure what is quantitatively uh, measure um, the anti antigen or the antibody present in the sample application it is you it's a immunodiffusion technique and mostly used in immunology to determine the quantity or concentration of an antigen in a sample it is also used to determine relative concentration of antibodies in serum estimate tra serum transferring an alpha ferroprotein to compare properties of two different antigens to determine relative purity of antigen preparation for disease diagnosis serological surveys etc there are various application so the uh, advantage of using the radial immunodiffusion is it is a concept of simple precipitation precipitation is gel is believed to provide more specific and sensitive result than other methods available the reaction is in the form of bands of precipitin it can be stained for better weaving as well as preservation if a large number of antigens are present each antigen antibody reaction will give rise to a separate line of precipitation this technique also indicates identity cross reaction non identity uh, between different antigen limitation it takes lot of time that is first limitation it has also been proposed that the results of masini test is influenced by the presence of metal cations in the test sample single diffusion method of precipitation is considered relatively wasteful than the other methods the test has been recently replaced with more sensitive and automated methods like elisa so there are limitations now coming to octaloni double diffusion method it's also a immuno diffusion technique used for detection or measurement of antibodies and antigens by their precipitation which involves diffusion through a substance such as agar or gel agarose so what i have mentioned here is double immuno diffusion octaloni double immuno diffusion so in this test an antigen solution or sample extract of interest is placed in wells bore on gel plates while sera of purified antibody are placed in other remaining wells on incubation both the antigens in the solution and the antibodies each diffuse out 
of their respective wells so you can see the way uh, this is done in the previous example there was antibody which was mixed in agarose gel but here you just pour the agar melt the agarose pour it on a glass slide and then allow it to solidify punch the wells in some of the wells you add antibody in some of the wells you add uh, antigen so now uh, as you keep it in moist chamber and observe you can see precipitin lines there will be different types of precipitin line at the precipitin pattern the bottom one where you can see the arc tells that the antibody can recognize antigen if you have put two different antigens um, both the antigens are similar or the, uh, this antibody can recognize completely both the antigen and in the second one if uh, you can see there is spur kind spur that is one of the antigen is half arc and another is straight line so that arc one is uh, identified the other one is not identified so only one of the antigen is identified by the type of antibody you have loaded in the well and in the first one where there is non identity the two lines intersect definitely there will be a zone of equivalence without interaction also because of the diffusion inside the agar so they form precipitant lines which cross each other uh, indicating that they are, they do not have full identity so that means they do not share common epitopes when you say full identity there there is presence of common epitopes in the antigen partial identity out of the two only one has the uh, 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 epitope which can be recognized by the antibody what has been loaded application it is useful for analysis of antigen and antibody it is useful for in detection identification and quantification of anti bodies and antigen such as immunoglobulin and extractable nuclear antigen uh, agarose gel immunodiffusion are used as serological test that historically has been reported to identify antibody against pathogenic uh, organism such as blastomyces identification fungal antigen there are so many examples which you can do with using odd so next coming to immuno electrophoresis so here you know that uh, there is movement of antigen and antibody in an agarose medium but in presence of an electric field that is Uh, agar agar's precipitation under uh, electric field so you have combination of electrophoresis and immunodiffusion here okay so how do you perform this what are the steps involved okay so i will make a slide here so in a slide you have one uh, well and you have a small well here is what you will be adding the serum okay in this serum you have the electrodes both the side you add your serum here and then allow it to electrophorize now the serum contains different proteins and under applied electrical field they have that is what is shown here they have different charge density and they have different movement and they move to towards each electrode uh, with a different velocity okay now after this you stop the electrophoresis now on to uh, the electrophorized uh, sample you add uh, 
antigens in this wells so once you had antigen in this well there is diffusion of the antigen into agarose if you keep it in moist chamber uh, when you keep it in moist chamber they diffuse and they form uh, uh, this kind of lines so formation uh, when you see this elliptical precipitin arcs they indicate that there is antigen antibody interaction if there is no precipitin lines then there is no reaction okay so first dimensional electrophoresis followed by immunodiffusion so uses it helps identify and approximate the quantity of some types of proteins present in serum and so it helps it is helpful in people suspected with monoclonal and poly polyclonal gammopathies it helps in identifying normal and abnormal protein like myeloma protein that might be present in human serum it is used complex protein mixture analysis uh, especially the ones containing various types of antigen it is one of the uh, traditional ways to analyze qualitatively m protein in both serum and urine it is used in analyzing the number of protein whether proteins are over produced or absent at all it is useful in diagnosing and evaluating the therapeutic response of many types of illness that affect body's immune system and also you can do antigen monitoring or antigen antibody purity you can check uh, um the basic thing is particular antigen and antibody can uh, mixture is there or not okay so now uh, coming further now we'll start up a, a different um, topics called as radio immuno assay okay radio immuno assay uh, it's a tech uh, it's a technique it was developed in 1960 by people called burson and uh, yalo and rosalin rosalin yalo and Ros uh, and they received a nobel prize for it also it sounds little complicated because you have a tagged antigen and you have the you have a normal antigen basically radio immuno assay is done here okay so how it is done first you have to take known amount of unlabeled antigens okay and then to that add known amount of labeled antigen what kind of labels can be there here it is iodine 125 labels or c14 label or tritium labels are used where you uh, label the antigens and then you add known quantity of the antigen uh, say you have taken 100 molecules of unknown uh, from the sample you have quantitated the protein and you have taken 100 molecules of the uh, what do you say Uh, the unlabeled antigen and then you know how much you have tagged the antigen with radioactivity and you have added that much of a known quantity of uh, antigen which is radioactive into the mixture and then the next step will be add fixed amount of antibody to the tubes so now if you say uh, whatever is more It will always be competing more for the antibody. Say you have added twenty antibodies. Now you have hundred unlabeled, and there there are only twenty or thirty labeled. Now the percentage of radioactivity will be very less binding. The more non-radioactive will be bound. So there is competition for binding sites. Uh, both the antigens are same. The only difference is one is labeled and one one is non-labeled. There is competition for binding to the antibody. Radioactive antigen is displaced from the antibody molecules by the unlabeled antigen. Precipitate or uh, antigen antibody complex with peg secondary antibody. 
now you add one more antibody and then precipitate it out the antibody bound antigen is separated from the uh, free antigen uh, in the supernatant fluid and the radioactivity of each is measured so when you measure you know what quantity of unlabeled antigen you have taken and then how much of uh, um, protein wise labeled antigen you have added you, you can titer what is uh, the antibody uh, unknown level of antibody which is present so from the data a standard binding curve can be drawn the sample to be assayed are run in parallel after determining the ratio of bound to free antigen in each unknown the antigen concentration can be read directly from the standard curve okay so this is how you can plot it and know what is the percentage uh, of your uh, sample mixture contains how much of unknown is present So uses of radioimmunoassay. Radioimmunoassay has revolutionized clinical research because uh, the sensitivity if you take sensitivity range is 0 0.0006 to 0 0.06 uh, microgram of antibody per ml is the sensitivity range. It's very high uh, and it is revolutionized research and clinical practice specifically in blood banking diagnosis of allergy endocrinology uh, and it, it is used to determine very small quantities of antigen and antibody in the serum and used for quantitation of hormones um, and viral antigens hepatitis b antigen and other viral antigen analyze nanomolar and picomolar concentration of hormones in biological sample the limitation is you are using radioactivity so you have to think about the shelf life also iodine 125 has 60 days but still you still have to think about shelf life and the problem associated with disposal of radioactive waste and then how you need to have sophisticated instrument for reading the uh, results so they they that include that are the major drawback of this uh, assay Engbel and Perlman uh, came out with some technique called as enzyme linked immunosorbent assay which is extensively used then RIA ELISA relay on specific antibody to bind the target antigen and uh, a detection system to indicate the presence and quantity of antigen binding so based on the type of antigen antibody reaction you have different types of ELISA techniques which are there in place so we'll briefly see what are the different types and then little about the advantages and disadvantages the first one is the simplest one which is called as direct ELISA imagine you have the ELISA plates those are nine nine micro titer plates or you have a slide which is coated with antigen and that is the uh, antigen and then you have a antibody which is tagged with the enzyme and you you can have a chemiluminescent or antibody also provided you have the detection system or antibody which is like uh, tagged with some enzyme which can convert the substrate into a chromogenic product and can be observed so for direct detection an antigen is coated into a multiple plate and is detected by antibody that has been directly conjugated to an enzyme this detection method is good option if there is no commercial available ELISA kits for your target protein it has advantages and disadvantages also advantages is it's quick because only one antibody is there and then no secondary antibodies uh, in added so cross reactivity is eliminated uh, only one antibody so it is faster and then give quick result but when you are coating the serum of a patient 
there might be adherent non adherent cells also which can coat on the cover slip or which can coat in the wells and they give the cross reactivity and uh, that might be adversely affecting um, affected by label labeling with enzymes or tags sorry cells mere adhere, adhere non adherent cells on cover slip with chemical bonds immune reactivity of the primary antibody might be adversely affected by labeling with enzymes or tags labeling primary antibodies for each specific elisa system is time consuming and expensive so every primary antibody you have to raise it purify it tag it that is very expensive non flexibility uh, is choice of primary antibody label for one experiment to another minimum signal amplification is there in uh, direct elisa so you have indirect elisa for which you have coated the antigen you have the primary antibody elicited uh, uh, so to that primary antibody fc region you have the secondary antigen which has the uh, enzyme attached to it so in this ca in this case it's an advantage suppose you are raising the primary antibody in mouse only one secondary antibody is enough to say that okay this in indirect elisa is working the amount of color fluorescence or luminescence reaction product that formed is measured using a sophisticated plate reader and compared with the amount generated with the same set of reaction performed using standard antibody concentration then you can quantitate your results okay so the second the biggest advantage here is a wide variety of labeled secondary uh, antibodies are available commercially versatile because many primary antibodies can be made in one species and the same labeled secondary antibodies can be used for detection maximum in immuno reactivity of primary antibody is retained because it is not labeled or modified uh, sensitivity is increased because each primary antibody contain several epitopes that can be bound by labeled secondary antibody allowing for signal amplification disadvantage again you have uh, adherence adhere non adherent non adherent cells on um, cover slip with chemical bond cross reactivity might occur with secondary antibody resulting in non specific signal but that is relatively very very less an extra incubation step is um, there in the procedure but that is advantages coming to next is sandwich elisa now sandwich elisa is like antigen can be detected or measured by sandwich elisa in this technique the antibody in the other uh, previous thing antigen what is coated but here the antibodies are immobilized on micro titer wells a sample containing unknown amount of antigen is allowed to react with the immobilized antibody after that wells are washed a second uh, enzyme linked antibody uh, specific for different epitopes on the antigen is added and allowed to react with the bound antigen now you have the primary antibody which is coated onto the well onto which you add your sample the antigens bind onto which you add the secondary antibody but that recognize some other epitope on the uh, antigen and that is linked with an enzyme after any free uh, you need to wash away with the uh, free secondary antibody uh, after any free secondary antibody is removed by washing the substrate is added and the colored reaction the product is measured the common variant on this uh, assay uses a biotin linked secondary antibody and then the enzyme like abidin is added 
Sandwich ELISA have proven particularly useful for measurement of soluble cytokine concentration in tissue uh, culture supernatant as well as in serum and body fluid. It's routinely used in monoclonal antibodies specific for different regions on the antigen. Then next, uh, yeah, it shows high specificity. Uh, that the antigen uh, analyte is uh, specifically captured and detected it's suitable for complex sample the antigen does not require purification prior to measurement flexibility and sensitivity because both direct and indirect detection methods can be used coming to competitive ELISA so here um, the competitive ELISA provides another extremely sensitive variation for measuring amounts of antigen in this technique the antibody is first incubated in solution with a sample containing antigen remember this there is a pre incubation of antibody with antigen to be measured now antigen antibody whatever concentration it is it's already bound The antigen antibody mixture is then added to a antigen uh, coated micro titer well. Now there is a micro titer well which is antigen coated. Okay. The my the more antigen present in the initial cell phase of the sample, the less free antibody will be available to bind the antigen coated well. After washing off the uh, unbound antibody, an enzyme conjugated antibody specific for the isotype of a first antibody can be added to determine the amount of antibody, first antibody bound to the well. So you have the, and uh, now you have the secondary antibody bound. In competitive assay, the higher the concentration of antigen in the original sample, the lower the final uh, signal uh, is there. So, you have the antigen in the uh, sample. You know the known quantity of antibody what you are mixing. Now, the, the, as the antigen sample increases, the anti antigen antibody reaction is more. Now whatever it is reacted there will be definitely some free antibodies that you mix into the well which contains antigen which is coated. Now the remaining antibodies which are not attached to antigen get attached to the coated wells. Wash out the sample, add the secondary antibody. That secondary antibody has an enzyme which develops the result and then you see what is the concentration. When the concentration is less in the sample, you get more color. When the concentration is more in the sample, you get less color. Okay. The main advantage of this kind of ELISA arises from its high sensitivity, its compositional difference in complex antigen mixture, even when the specific detecting antibody is present in relatively small amount. So ELISA outputs are quantitative, qualitative, semi-quantitative. Quantitative data can be interpreted in comparison to standard curve in order to precisely calculate the concentration of antigen in various sample. Qualitative ELISA can also be used to achieve yes or no kind of an answer where uh, whether a particular antigen is present in a sample as compared to blank well containing no antigen or an unrelated control antigen. Semi-quantitative ELISA can be used to compare the relative levels of antigen in assay sample. Since the intensity of signal will vary directly with antigen concentration. So application, it has a huge application in clinical, uh, yeah, clinical uh, sample analysis for detection of uh, HIV antibodies in blood sample, for detection of hepatitis B, detection of any other kind of viruses, etc. Has, ELISA has a huge application. 
the next topic what i am going to uh, take up is auto radiography so here the concept of auto radiography started with the observation of becquerel he uh, you know the unit of radioactivity and all uh, but i'll not touch that but what he observed is silver chloride or silver iodide emulsion when they are touched with uranium salts that there is a blackening which can be seen this observation led to the development of auto radiography auto radiography is any technique used to produce an image of the 2d distribution of radioactive substance development of auto radiography as a biological technique really started to happen after world war 2 with the development of photographic emulsion and then stripping film made up of silver halide so there are uh, two types of auto radiography can be there in vivo auto radiography and in vitro auto radiography uh, in vivo auto radiography is like you have uh, receptors are labeled in intact living cells by systemic administration of radio uh, ligand like in your pet scan positron em emission tomography where you have some radioactive uh, sample which you will be in ingesting or inhaling or intravenous given and those get accumulated where you have for example cancerous tissue they get accumulated and they are imaged and then identified in case of lab animals you give the uh, tracer um, radioactive elements and these are getting concentrated in specific tissues where there is lot of growth and the tissue is removed processed and visualized in vitro auto -ra radiography is like when slides mounted tissue sections are incubated with radio ligands so that receptors are labeled under various very controlled conditions okay so the type of radio isotopes what you can use is c14 tritium h3 s35 p32 these are all beta emitter uh, iodine 125 gamma emitter and iodine 131 which is beta emitter so these kind of radioactive uh, nuclei can be used so how you can use so you have uh, a tissue which you have section and then you have section this and then you have specific uh, peptide safe peptide you have and then that uh, peptide has a sulfur in, uh, instead of co nh bond the peptide bond you can have sulfur also there there are um, uh, artificial synthesized peptides that peptide if it is uh, having affinity on the receptor it goes and binds to a specific region in the tissue where the receptor is there now the tissue is fixed in uh, at, uh, on the slide and then exposed to film this film are nothing but silver halide say silver chloride now when you have silver halide and they are exposed to radiation beta or gamma radiation they get reduced to elemental silver so wherever your sample has localized emitting of the um, radioactive rays you have this conversion that is reduction of silver chloride say silver chloride to uh, elemental silver so now you have methods of developing where all the uh, unreduced uh, silver chlorides are removed off and wherever this elemental silver is there appears as a patch and that is how autograph radiography thin films are developed so apart from uh, x ray sheets uh, thin films more modern trends in auto radiography involve replacing high speed x ray films uh, with radiation detector systems laser scanners and computer based imaging system a variety of radiation detecting crystals or and phosphors have been developed for this purpose uh, you have to store this at uh, um, proper condition 
storage phosphor screens are more sensitive by a factor of about 2200 for beta emitting uh, radionucleotide and other reusable and they are used reusable also microchannel array detector have been introduced to replace both x-ray film and phosphor screen first was majority of use was x-ray films wow whatever i used also was x-ray films now you have phosphors and now you uh, more advanced to that is micro channel array detectors the new instruments are faster by the order of 10 than uh, phosphor screen and have greater image resolu resolution than uh, do phosphor screens to, for detecting latent image uh, from hybrid, uh, hybridization studies using micromolecules labeled with carbon 14, sulfur 35, phosphorus 32 and iodine 125 from flat gels, blood, membranes, tissue, uh, slices and other flat specimen. So in case of um, normal developing blood, the phosphors, what can be uh, used with all these samples you can use gels you can use blots you can use membranes tissue uh, slices and other flat specimens auto radiography has a large number of applica practical application in biological chemical and physical science because it provides both qualitative and quantitative information like images and amounts present it may be used to image large small microscopic specimens uh, including sectioned whole organisms uh, organs tissue cellular structures and nucleic acids that contain some radioactive or radio labeled compound there is something called as micro autoradiography which involves coating of the sample directly with a radiation sensitive emulsion uh, cellular constituents that have been incorporated the radio label can be clearly identified auto radiography is used with electrophoresis or chromatography to image radio labeled macromolecules and other separated chemicals for quantitative analysis so this chapter i mean till now the talk uh, whatever i have completed is what are the principle and application of precipitation and agglutination a immunodiffusion techniques like single diffusion double diffusion what is immunoelectrophoresis how is it performed and then what is radio immunoassay and then what is ELISA what are the different forms of ELISA the advantages what is autoradiography you have principle and application of autoradiography uh, anything you can write to me or uh, you can message me thank you